Good morning to everyone. It's so good to see you today. So great to be back with you again. Yeah, I did have the COVID, or as someone I heard say this week, the covert. I never heard it said like that, but I was sitting in a McDonald's uh, doing some studying before I had to go to a meeting, and there was a group of men. I could tell they met every day in there. They were talking, and they were uh, being pretty loud, and I could overhear the conversation. And one of the men said, and he was as serious as he could be, he said, I am so glad, and I pray that my wife and I have not gotten that covert thing yet. And I looked, and I started saying, well, I had that covert thing, all right? But no, I had a very mild case, and... And uh, thank you for your prayers. Uh, thank you for prayers for my wife. Fortunately, she never got it. Uh, she was able to avoid that. And I believe that's through the prayers of uh, uh, people like our church family here at Concord. So thank you very much. And speaking of prayer, we're coming off 21 days of prayer uh, today. And uh, I know last year we had a great celebration and everybody was together from all our campuses, and, and there all of you were in one place, and, and it was just a great time. Well, because of COVID protocols, there is no way we could do that this year. Uh, we tried. We looked at every option out there, and there was just no way to do it and do it safely. But we still have a lot to celebrate. So I've asked Randy to come and just share with us some of the highlights of what God has been doing and is doing uh, during the 21 days of prayer. Randy? Amen. Thank you, Larry. And you know, I, I'll be honest, I, I had some very specific prayers I prayed throughout uh, the 21 days, and, and honestly, they weren't answered the way maybe I would have chosen for them to be answered. And, and I think sometimes even as I look back over this 21 days, you know, a lot of times we kind of expect God to do things the way we want Him to, right? And He teaches us maybe a little something different. And so I know this year, uh, well, like Larry just said, last year, man, I sat in this room looking out from the stage on that Sunday night, every one of our campuses packed, not a seat in the room. And we were hearing uh, testimonies of a lot of what we thought at the time were, were miraculous prayers. And so uh, this 21 days, I'll be honest, I didn't hear a, a tremendous amount of miraculous answered prayers except maybe that maybe they are kind of miraculous all right I'm gonna put it in perspective because I got an email last night from one of our college students he was here every single morning and he sent this email last night it says there's not something I can pinpoint that's like oh here's an answered prayer but what there has been is God revealing himself and his faithfulness to me in ways I've never seen I remember a few days ago just sitting there looking back and asking God, why are you so faithful? It doesn't make sense. And God has just shown me that it's not me earning it, but Him loving me enough to give it. And these past few weeks have really just brought me to a place of adoration for God and of, and of confidence for all He is doing and is going to do, even if I don't see it or understand it. You know, I, I talked to so many of our members, uh, some through email, some just personal conversations of, of how God was growing them and their families during that 21 days. I talked to one family, uh, small kids in the family, and, and they said something that knew they were doing there during that 21 days was getting up every morning and reading Scripture. I actually saw another family just uh, Friday night, ran to, to grab a bite to eat after a, a basketball game. Ran into a Concord family there, and, and, and they just kind of casually said, well, yeah, this is a restaurant we can come to. What do you mean you can come to this? There are a lot of restaurants around. Well, it turned out that part of their fast uh, restricted what they could eat. And so they, they had chosen a restaurant based off of one that they, they would stay within that fast. They were growing in their walk with him. You know, we, uh, uh, I think one of the, the prayers I heard answered actually started last year, last January, during 21 days. It's a, a family, they, they actually go to our Mount Yona campus, y'all may be listening right now, uh, go to our Mount Yona campus, and they own a, a produce stand. And during the 21 days of prayer last year, they felt like God was telling them to close the stand on Sundays. And they didn't really understand that because they needed the income, but they were like, okay, God's telling us to do this. So they did. 
And he sat right over there this week sharing with me how God has blessed them. And they've actually had the best year they've ever had at their produce stand. I know uh, many of you are watching online right now. We, we broadcast the prayer service. Many of you are on there uh, watching each morning. I know one morning we were so excited because one of our, our members shared that uh, a friend of theirs, long lost friend, well a high school friend, had come to know Christ. And so she was reaching out on that Facebook trying to find a small group to connect her new Christian friend, old friend, new Christian friend with. And so we were able to do that and, and help connect. And by the way, just a little plug here, community groups do start back in two weeks. All right? <laughs> so remember that. Two weeks we're starting back community groups. But, you know, last night uh, as we were going to bed and, and my wife and I, we pray each night uh, together and one of the things we said, and we say this every Saturday night, is God, draw people to your building tomorrow morning. Uh, man, I never would have guessed that he would answer that prayer during 21 days at 5 a.m. one morning. I was walking in, a couple of us had just gotten here, and uh, somebody was kind of walking out of the shadows. Well, it was somebody out walking, and they were like, why are people here at 5 a.m.? And so... They actually came in and, and joined us and, and joined us for prayer that morning. And so we were able to honestly reach out into our community through 21 days of prayer. So even though it may, we kind of had some expectations of what it was going to look like. I think God, God kind of has taught us again, <laughs> one more time for me, hey, don't, don't tell me how this is all going to go. I'm going to teach you through this. It was so exciting to see so many people growing closer in their walk through this 21 days. And so what I want to encourage you right now is, man, get your Bibles out because we're fixing to get into the book of joy and talk a little bit more about what God's doing. All right, thank you all so much. Thank you for being a part of 21 Days this year. Amen. <clears throat> thank you, Randy, for sharing that. What a great word and what a powerful word. And, you know, uh, as I was listening to you taught, Randy, it, uh, God reminded me uh, that uh, just because the 21 days is over doesn't mean that he's going to stop answering the prayers that you, you've been praying. Uh, just like the, the family last year that was right after 21 days of prayer, that, that God worked in their lives to take the step in their business that they took. Uh, that was a huge step and a step of faith, and then God has worked the way he's worked. Well, uh, maybe you've prayed some prayers, and, and, and you may have prayed for someone, or you may have prayed for something, and you say, well, God hasn't answered that yet. God has three ways of answering prayer. One is an immediate yes, and, and you've seen that happen. You've prayed, and then God just answered it. But let me ask you this. How many times have you prayed, and God answered the prayer, and then you were shocked? <laughs> you went, my stars. I, I mean, I prayed it, but I'm not sure I really believed it, but God did it. The second way that God answers prayers is sometimes he says no. He says, no, uh, uh, he has another plan in mind, and we can't see that because we can only see now and our circumstances, but God sees the end from the beginning. But there's a third way, and that's delay. But uh, God's delays are not God's dead ends. And so you may have prayed something, and it may not have been answered yet. Don't give up praying, and don't give up trusting, because God is still at work. But what a great work God's done. So many join online every day, and we're part of the 21 days of prayer. I believe this, the most powerful ministry of any church, and the most powerful ministry of every healthy church, is its prayer ministry. Did you hear me? It's more important than preaching. It's more important than singing. Prayer is the most important part of any church. I was uh, had the opportunity Friday night, along with one of my best friends in ministry, Frank Cox, to go to, to be in Athens to do a conference for a church uh, that, that they're trying to reach the next level in attendance. They're trying to reach that 1,000 mark. And, and they, uh, they had four speakers, two on Friday night, two on Saturday morning. And our assignments were to talk about doing this to reach 1,000. And my assignment was praying your way to 1,000. And, um, and I said to the church that night, to the leadership that was there that night, I said, you know, uh, the most important thing you can do if you want to reach a thousand people is to pray. It's to pray and then trust God. So whatever it is we need God to do at Concord, all we need to do is pray and ask Him. Amen? 
and God will do that. Well, as uh, Randy also said, we're going to get into a new study today. It's, it's a, and one of my favorite books of the uh, Bible. Uh, it's an exciting book. Um, uh, we're going to have a good time, or as I told the 8 o'clock crowd, I'm going to have a good time whether you do or not, and uh, hopefully you will too. It's in the book of Philippians, and we're just going to walk through Philippians. Uh, and, and what we're going to look at is this. The, the theme is unchained, unchained. Now, when you read Philippians, uh, you're going to see that uh, uh, Paul had been imprisoned when he was at Philippi, we'll talk more about that in a moment. But when he was at Philippi, uh, he was in, he was thrown into prison. When Paul wrote the letter to the Philippian Christians, he was in prison in Rome. So two prison experiences, and in both of those, he was chained to Roman guards. He was literally chained to Roman guards. How would you have liked to have been a lost Roman guard chained to the Apostle Paul? Uh, I'm telling you. You were in for a long day or a long night because all he was going to do is tell you about Jesus the whole time. And he did. You see that throughout his letters. He, he, he looked at his imprisonment as the freedom to share the gospel. So even though Paul was chained physically, he was unchained from the control of the circumstances around him. And folks, that's what we're going to talk about. How to overcome circumstances. How to have victory. How to, how to walk in faith, how to experience the power of God even when the circumstances are not the very best. How do you do that? Well, that's what we're going to learn through Philippians this morning. We're going to just do an overview and kind of a backstory because I believe this. Anytime you look into God's Word, you need to know uh, the backstory and you need to know what the overall picture is. So we're going to do that very quickly this morning. Philippians chapter 1, if you'll open your Bibles there on all of our campuses and also online. And uh, then would you stand with me as I read? We're going to read the first five verses. Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. Paul says in his letter, he opens up this way, he says, I am sold out to Jesus. Folks, let me tell you something. The greatest thing in life we can ever do is to sell out to Jesus. The greatest thing we can ever teach our children is how to sell out to Jesus. The greatest thing that the church can do as a body, as a community, is to sell out to to Jesus. And that's what Paul said. He said, I, Paul and Timothy, we're sold out to Jesus. He said, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you. He said, every time I think about you, I thank God for you. Every time. He said, every time you come to my mind, I thank God for you. Always praying with joy for all of you, for every one of you, in my every prayer. Now listen, there are all kinds of people in church. All kinds. Some you have a better relationship with than others. Let's just be honest. I, I, I saw one uh, staff member's office one time in church I pastored. And uh, he, had a, he had a little sign inside his door. He said, everyone who comes into my office is a blessing. Some when they enter and some when they leave. <laughs> and maybe that's where you are. Maybe there's some people in church that when you're not around them, it's a greater blessing. But let me ask you, have you ever thought about praying for those people? Paul said, I pray for all of you. Every one of them. And you're going to see, Church of Philippi was made up of all kinds of people. But he said, I pray for you. Now look at what he says. And he said, I don't only pray for you. I pray for you in joy. <laughs> I enjoy praying for you. He said, it's a good thing. And then in verse 5, he said, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day I met you until right now. What a great lead-in this is to the book of Philippians. Thank you. You may be seated. This church, the church at Philippi, was established by Paul and Silas. Now, Paul and Timothy are, 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 are speaking to them, but it was Paul and Silas who established this church. And they established it on Paul's second missionary journey. Now, we like to say today our current 
uh, uh, way of saying that is our mission trips. So it was on the second mission trip uh, that Paul took that the church at Philippi was established. So if you take a note, write that down. It was a second missionary journey. But here's what's really important. The second thing is this. Paul was in the region around Philippi and in Philippi itself because of a plea for help. Someone had cried out and asked him to come there. If you look in Acts 16, jot this down because it's very important. Acts 16 is the backstory to the book of Philippians. In Acts chapter 16, Paul is about to, to leave to go on his mission trip. And he's going to one place. He's headed in one direction. He has plans to go to this place when God uses another man to cry out and beg him to come to Mas the region of Macedonia. So Paul had his plans, and then he realized God had another plan. You ever, have you ever had that happen in your life? You ever had a plan, you thought it was the right plan, but then all of a sudden God changed the plan? Folks, let me tell you, God's plans are always the right plans. And, and God may change the plans. Let me ask you, has God ever put on your heart to go speak to somebody? Maybe there's somebody you, you, you had met that, that you knew wasn't a Christian, wasn't a follower of Christ, and boy, God just got on you and got all over you to go speak to that person. And you made every excuse in the world for not doing it, but you knew that God wanted you to go there. Or maybe someone to share an encouraging word with. Someone that, that maybe had been through some tough circumstances. And man, God just put it on you. Listen, if God puts it on your heart, if you know it's of God, if you know it's Him, it's not too much pizza on Saturday night, but it's God. If you know it's Him, if God puts it on your heart, always obey God. Paul did. So he goes to this region and he ends up in Philippi. While in Philippi, the third thing we learn is this. Paul was thrown into prison. Now that's important. Because what Paul says in this letter, and we just read it, Paul said, I have great memories of you. Every time I think of you, it brings me joy. Let me ask you, if you had been thrown into prison in that town, would it bring great joy to you? Let me put it this way to you. Maybe you weren't thrown into prison, but you got a traffic ticket in a certain area of Hall County. I'm going to ask you if you did. No, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, all right? But you got a traffic ticket. When you drive by that area, does that bring great memories to you? <laughs> but here Paul is. He was thrown into a Philippian prison, and he was thrown in prison for preaching the gospel, for telling people about Jesus. And now he's saying it brings me great joy. You know what that is? It's being unchained from your circumstances. It's being controlled by the power of God. So Paul was thrown into prison in Philippi. Now, it doesn't get much better circumstantially. The, the final thing we see is this. When Paul wrote this letter to the church at Philippi, he was in prison again, this time in Rome. Someone said it this way. When Paul went to a town, he never checked out the local Holiday Inn. He always checked out the jail because he was going to live there before it was over with. And that was, a, that was pretty true because people who were opposed to the gospel did everything they could to shut Paul up. And so now he's in a Roman prison, again, chained to guards, prison guards, but yet he's writing this letter, the letter of joy. If you want to char characterize Philippians in one word, it is joy. Okay, so you kind of got the backstory. You see where Paul's coming from. But in all his circumstances, Paul never gave up. And Paul never was defeated. And he never allowed his circumstances to control him. Paul made a commitment that he would sell out to Jesus and that the control of his life would be given over to Jesus. And whatever happened to him, and we're going to see this directly next week, that whatever happened to him, he looked at as an opportunity, not an obstruction. And it was an opportunity to share the gospel. Now, folks, let's be honest. That's not always easy. Amen? It's not always easy. And I'm not standing up here today declaring to you, man, this is easy stuff. But I will tell you this. I will tell you this. When we're controlled by the power of God, and we know that God is in control, and we trust Him, 
it will bring peace to our lives that you'll find nowhere else. So, with that said, let's look at some things that we're reminded of in Philippians. And this gives you the, the, the total picture of where we're going. There, there, there are four or five things that we need to know that we see in Philippians. Number one, the first thing we learn from, and we learn it in the passage we read today, is this. Gratitude is a needed attitude. <laughs> gratitude. A grateful spirit is very needed in the church. To express gratitude. Go back and look at it. Paul says, in, in the very beginning, in verse 2, he says, uh, he says to, or in verse 1 and 2, he talks about writing to all the saints, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. You say, well now, which ones of the church of Philippi were saints? Every follower of Christ. Now, we use that term a little differently. I, 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 I've, I've used it so many times. I had a lady in my church that uh, she had gotten older. She wasn't able to come to church any longer. Her health just didn't allow it. But she was such a prayer warrior. She prayed for our church. Hey, listen, when I was standing up preaching uh, three services on Sunday morning, I knew that Miss Berta was praying for me. Every service, she would pray. And she would pray for people in our church who were sick. She would pray for people in our church with financial needs. She would pray for people uh, that lived in her neighborhood that weren't Christians. She just was a prayer warrior. And this is how I would describe her. I'd say, Miss Berta is a saint. And she was. But can I tell you this? The person who got on my nerves the most in the church, and they will go unnamed, <laughs> who was a follower of Christ, that person was as much a saint as Miss Berta. You say, now come on, give me a break. No. You know what a saint is? It's a person who has a relationship with Jesus Christ. So, if you're a Christian, you're a saint. So husbands, go home this afternoon and just say to your wife, now you need to address me as saint. Now I'm not going to tell you how that's going to turn out, but you'll find out pretty quickly. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, every Christian is a saint. My hero... Uh, in ministry is Adrian Rogers, and I loved Adrian, and I loved his preaching, and I just loved everything about him, and, and uh, uh, he's such a godly, humble man. But Adrian, you say it this way, you're either a saint or an ain't. You're one or the other, <laughs> which means you're either a follower of Christ or you're not a follower of Christ. So Paul is saying, I'm writing to all the saints, and then he comes back, and he says it again in the passage that we read. If you, if you look at it, he, in verse 3, he says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you. Always praying with joy for all of you. Every one of you. Every one of you. Paul said, I'm grateful for you. And he writes it in a letter to them. Folks, listen, I believe in email. I believe in texting. I use it all the time. And you can encourage people through a text. You can really encourage them through a text. But I want to ask you a question. Isn't there something special when you get a handwritten note from somebody? When you get a handwritten note that says, I'm thinking of you, I'm praying for you, I care about you. This morning after the first service, <coughs> a lady uh, came up to me who's a nurse. She said, lady, I'll tell you how that works. She said, this week... She said, you know how overwhelmed all our hospital staff is right now in all of our hospitals. And they are. My, our daughter-in-law is a nurse. We were talking about it yesterday. We've got nurses and doctors and medical professionals and frontline people in our church. You're overwhelmed. And folks, by the way, we need to be praying for our frontline people. Uh, it, it's really difficult right now. Long shifts, long days, long hours, seeing a lot of tragedy. She said, but she said, Friday at work, <clears throat> she said a church somewhere, its people had written, handwritten notes, and they delivered a note to every nurse. She said, if you just knew how much that encouraged me. Hey, church, that's something we can do. Amen? Think of somebody this week that you can write a handwritten note to. You say, man, I, don't, I haven't written a handwritten note in 10 years. Well, let this be the start of something new, all right? Just something that says, I'm grateful for you. Gratitude is a needed attitude. <clears throat> the second thing you see here is this. The gospel is inclusive. 
The gospel is inclusive. Now, you've got to look at Acts 16 to understand this. But I want to tell you the makeup of the Philippian church. Let me tell you at least three people who were, about three people who were in the Philippian church. And this is so important. The first one was a lady named Lydia. In Acts chapter 16, it says, When Paul got to the region around Philippi, he met a woman whose name was Lydia. Lydia was a seller of purple. She was a seller of uh, uh, cloth material that was some of the most expensive in the world. She was a businesswoman. She was a very wealthy woman. She had an Asiatic background. Paul met her and led her to Jesus. He leaves that encounter, and the next person he encounters is a young girl <clears throat> who is telling fortunes. People are using her to tell people's fortunes, and they're making a profit off of it. She was a slave girl. And to society, she was a nobody. She had a Greek background. So Paul goes from Lydia, who has an Asiatic background, to this young girl who has a Greek background, leads her to Jesus. And because he led her to Jesus, people got upset because their, their way of making a living or making money had been taken away from them. They had Paul thrown into jail for that. And while he's in jail, he's sitting there at midnight not complaining not saying, God, why did you let this happen to me? But he's sitting there, him and Silas, and they're singing songs, and God opens the prison doors. The, the jailer who was in charge of them is about to take his life because I, part of his job description was this, if your prisoners escape, we execute you. And Paul yells out, do yourself no harm. We haven't gone anywhere. And he proceeds to talk to the jailer. Listen now. The jailer gets saved. He goes to the jailer's house. The jailer's family gets saved. They're all baptized. <coughs> He's Roman. So you've got an Asiatic woman. You've got a Greek young girl. You've got a Roman soldier. And they all are now saved. And they're all in the church of Philippi. And they had nothing in common except one thing. Jesus. Folks, let me tell you, it doesn't matter how different we are at Concord. It doesn't matter what the background, how the backgrounds differ. It doesn't matter what your likes and dislikes are. It doesn't matter if you see things this way and somebody else sees them this way. I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter what your political background is. It doesn't matter what your economic background or your social background. There's one thing we have in common, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the most important thing there is. It's Jesus. But let me tell you about these three people. They came from different parts of society, too. Lydia came from the upper level of society, well-respected, very wealthy. The young girl came from the lower part of society. She wasn't even looked upon as a person by most people. She was put down. Nobody much wanted to be around her. The Roman soldier was middle-class society. But again, they're all in the church. Folks, listen. Our church should look like our community. All of our campuses should look like the community around the church. That should be, listen, if there's anything that should be our prayer in 2021, it is help us to reach the community around us. Because that's exactly what the churches in the New Testament did. It didn't matter that this girl was a nobody to everybody else. She was somebody to Jesus. She became somebody to the people in the church. It didn't matter that Lydia had a lot of money. They didn't want her in the church because she had a lot of money. They wanted her in the church because she now knew Jesus. And now here was this Roman soldier who had been in charge of a lot of them who had been thrown into prison for their faith, and now he's in the church too, and they're loving him. That's what a church should look like. That's what a church should look like. The truth of the matter is we're all in this together, amen? And we're all facing circumstances that are not the best in the world. We need one another desperately. Well, third thing that you see in Philippians, and it is this, that the Christian citizenship is in heaven. Not only is, is the, the, the gospel inclusive, and not only is an attitude of gratitude needed, but the Christian citizenship is in heaven. Philippi was a Roman colony. That's important. No place were people more proud of being Roman citizens than in a Roman colony. 
In fact, if you asked someone where they were from, they would have proudly said, I'm from Philippi, because that was a Roman colony. Paul speaks to that, and he reminds them in chapter 3, verse 20, that their true citizenship is not Philippi, their true citizenship is heaven. And so what is he saying there? Is he saying that it doesn't matter that they were in Philippi? No. <clears throat> is he saying that you shouldn't uh, be glad that you live in Philippi? No. But what he was saying is this, we must never forget, we must never forget that no matter where we live, ultimately we're part of God's community. What does that mean to us? Now hear me carefully. If you're going to tweet this, wait till I say everything, okay? I'm proud to live in America. I'm glad I live in America. I'm grateful. Listen, I didn't choose to live here. I was born here. And so I just have to thank God for it. And, and I don't know why he allowed me to be, and, but he did. And I'm grateful and I love our country. I'm patriotic. I, I, I love it. But I'm going to tell you something. We must be very careful that as, as Christians who live in America, that it doesn't become something of ego to us. Because really, when it all comes down to it, we're part of God's community. Our citizenship is in heaven. Amen? So that, you know what that means? When things happen in our country we like, we're still citizens of heaven. When things happen in our country we don't like, we're still citizens of heaven. And that's very important. And that's what Paul was reminding the people at Philippi, remember where you really belong ultimately. And then number four, <clears throat> the, things we're, the thing we learn is that trials are very real. Trials are very real. Philippians is a letter to encourage the Christian in the trials that a Christian goes through. Philippians 1, 28 through 30, we'll see that next week. But trials are very real. I want you to hear me. Christians go through trials just like non-Christians do. We're not exempt from trials because we're followers of Christ. And some of you are really going through some trials right now. I know... Uh, we were talking, some of us, and when COVID first hit, I personally couldn't name you one person I knew who had this disease. Folks, I could start now, and for five minutes, I could name you people I know. And I could talk to you, but I have two pastor friends that both of them, and one of them, Grew up in Hall County, and his dad was a pastor in Hall County for years. His name's Craig Dale. Craig is a pastor at Ivy Creek in Buford, but his daddy pastored churches in Gainesville. His dad just died right after Christmas. Another friend of mine, Harris Malcolm, his dad died right after Christmas, both of COVID. They're going through a tr that trial right now. A and what's unfortunate is that because of COVID protocols, even the family's not been able to get together sometimes the way they wanted to. And, and, and it's, it's a difficult time. Folks, trials are re real. But listen, you know what Paul says? He doesn't make light of the trials, but let's get this today. And I hope you'll get this. I hope it help you. He reminds them that the power and presence of God is still there, even in the middle of the trial. We still have the presence of God, and we still have God's power available to us. The final thing is this. Unity is vital to the mission of the church. Unity is vital. Now the church at Philippi, there were no really big problems. It's not like the church at Corinth where there were major problems. There were really no big problems at Philippi. The letter of Philippians is really, as we said, a letter of joy and it's an encouragement letter and it's a, th a letter of thanksgiving. But there was a small problem. There were two ladies in the church who couldn't get along. Now, I know that shocks you that in church there will ever be two people who can't get along. You know, um, I, 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 I tell people that become Christians, become part of the church, I said, you got to remember one thing. The church is still made up of people, okay? And people are people, amen? And, and sometimes people just seemingly don't get along. Well, these two ladies had an issue. Don't really know all about it, what it was. But here's what Paul said. He said to the leaders of the church, maintain the unity of the church. He said, don't allow 
someone's problems to become more important than the mission. Don't allow somebody's agenda to take priority over the mission. Folks, we have to be very careful that we don't allow personal agendas to take precedence over what God's called us to be as a church. Amen? It's very important. And, and, and unity is something that is so much needed. It's amazing the things that churches can get all bent out of shape. People in church can get bent out of shape about. I've seen it all my life. Even before I was a pastor, I saw it growing up being in church. And I, I saw it as a pastor. I see it in ministry. People can get bent out of shape about all kinds of things. I remember <clears throat> there was a time in our church that uh, I, I made a statement. You know, we pastors get in the pulpit and we just make statements. I, I, I made the statement. I said, uh, Whatever we do in this church, we're going to be about including and reaching people who don't know Jesus. Amen. Everybody, amen. So that next week, I'm in my study time, and God speaks to me, not audibly, but in my heart. He said, do you really mean that? Well, that hurt my ego. Yeah, I mean that. Well, then what about these sports programs you have at your church? You see, at that time, we had a real strong adult softball program. Some of you are old enough, you, uh, you remember playing church softball. <clears throat> and I was, you know, I was going to be really spiritual. And I got to the point, I started off to play on our softball team. You had to come two Sundays a month. Then I thought, that's not enough. You got to come three Sundays. And then I thought, well, that's not enough. Now you got to tithe. Then I thought, that's not enough. Now you got to give the church your firstborn child. And if you'll do all that, we might let you play ball. We might. And God said, you don't have one unchurched person playing on any of your sports teams. But you say you're for the community. Well, we made a decision that we would reserve at least two spots on every team for unchurched people. Now, see, you're looking at me, and some of you have been there. Here's what you're thinking. You allowed unchurched people to play on your church team? Didn't that cause problems? If you're thinking that, you never played ball with church people. Mm -hmm. You laugh because you know some of the biggest fights I ever saw was in church ball, okay? You know what happened when we started including the lost? <coughs> Our attitudes got better. Because all of a sudden, all the guys on the church team or the ladies on the church team realized something. My witness is at stake. I got this guy over here, this lady over here that doesn't know Jesus and how I behave may determine whether they come to know Jesus or not. And the people we included, they were just so shocked we let them play that they didn't want to mess it up. It's amazing what churches can get bent out of shape about. Folks, listen. What we need to do is rally around the gospel. Amen? And rally around the mission. Would you pray with me this morning? And as you're bowing in prayer right now, would you ask God to really speak to you through Philippians? Just to really minister to you. We're going to get very specific into applicable uh, points from this book that will help us all, whatever we're going through in life. But would you pray right now and just say, God, speak to me. And then just go home and read it over and over. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you today. For loving us and thank you for giving us the letters that we have in the new testament thank you for the letter to the philippian christians thank you lord for what it teaches us and how it encourages us so i pray lord today that you would just stop help us each one to gain the principles from this book that will help us to be able to deal with the circumstances around us i pray it today in jesus name amen I'm going to give the service back to our campus pastors. But to those of you who are watching online and those who are here at Claremont, first, let me say, if you haven't given your life to Jesus, if you've not trusted him as your Savior, God loves you. God sent Jesus to die on a cross to forgive your sin and, and to change your life. And you're going to learn the church is not made up of perfect people. It's just made up of people who have been forgiven by the power of God and the cross and maybe you want to you need to give your life to christ here's what we're going to do if you're online 
There's a number and an email address. Just reach out to us that way. If you're in the room this morning, as soon as this last song is done, there's going to be church leaders standing right here at the front of this stage area on the floor. You come and just say, hey, I want to know Jesus. I want this Jesus that Pastor talked about today to live in my life. Or maybe today you're a Christian and you just need prayer. You just, you just need someone to pray with you. We want to do that. Or if you know, if maybe there's somebody you're praying for and you want someone to join with you and pray for that person, maybe that you've been a witness to. You come this morning. But let's stand at this time. Let's sing. And then after this prayer and after our host closes us out, you make yourself uh, available to those prayer partners and let them pray with you this morning. Let's sing together.